So here are a couple of slides that we have a better design. Some of this might be a bit of review from an elementary school uh, science uh, class, but it's worth going through a couple of these basic points so that you uh, have a better understanding when you get into use the technology for audio recording. You'll know um, a bit more about the background. Sound is a form of kinetic energy. What does it mean if something's kinetic? It moves. Right? Sound is moving. Something has to move for sound to be created. It's a series of vibrations. That much I'm sure you know, right? All of you had a slinky when you were a kid, maybe at some point? No? One of these little things? Right? Big coil, and you could bounce it back and forth. And if you got really clever with it, you could put it at the top of the stairs, and it would collapse its way all the way to the bottom of the stairs. That is similar to sound in the sense that you have that series of vibrations or that movement along the coil all the way from one end to the other. So when you get a sound source that vibrates, it transfers its energy into the surrounding air particles. Imagine holding a little pebble above this pool here, and as I drop the pebbles in, it strikes the water, breaks the surface tension, and then it causes that wave to radiate out from the center. As I'm gabbing away to you here, the same sort of thing is happening. My vocal cords are vibrating. That moves the air around in my throat. I open up my mouth, and that sound wave travels through the air, Okay, and then hits your ear. You've got to have a couple of different things for sound to be created and heard, at least three different things. Something has to vibrate. Okay, something has to be in, in kinetic motion. So you can imagine a guitar string, right? It's a good analogy for you guys. So you pluck that string, and you can see it vibrating. You know it's moving. Then we have to have a medium of transportation, which generally is air. Right? When I'm talking to you in here, air is very thin, but it does have a certain mass, and the wave is able to travel through the air. There are other mediums of transportation for sound, though, other than air. Can you think of any others? Any other places you can hear sound? Jamar? Water. Water, yeah. I don't know if you've ever been, well, I'm sure all of you have been in a pool at some point or the experience of being in a lake. If you're in a lake, you can hear a motorboat coming from way down the lake. You can almost feel it in your neck. The sound waves travel through the water in that case. And for great distances, whales communicate over miles and miles doing that, right? Travels through the water. Funny enough, in space, can you hear sound in space? No. Because there's no, it's space is in a vacuum. There is no air. So there's no medium of transportation. So all of those Star Trek and Star Wars movies that you see with the big explosions going off in space, it's all made up. Because you can't hear anything out there anyway. It's got to have the vibration, the medium of transportation, but we need to have the final third step, which is something to receive the sound at the other end and interpret it, in which case we have our ears, right? There's tiny little bones inside our ears that vibrate based on the sound waves that are coming into your ears. And that tiny little vibration of those bones in your ears gets uh, transferred into little electrical impulses that can travel on your nerves and into your brain. Okay. Very complicated little system, but it works. You can kind of think of a microphone and a recording system as almost being a receiver too. It works the same way. Okay, a couple characteristics of sound that are really important to us here. If you're in Mr. Horner's class or Mr. Racine's class, you would talk about quite a number of different characteristics of sound, certainly more than two. But these are the two main ones that we're interested in when it comes to recording sound. Frequency or pitch of the sound, okay, so how high or how low the sound is. And then the volume or the level of the sound. Is it like a low volume sound or is it something really loud? Right? If you've played piano, you know that the keys on the left-hand side of the keyboard are the, the lower pitch, and then as you work your way up the keyboard to the right, they get higher. And if we could graph one of those sound waves, one of those ripples out of the pond, if we could graph it, it would look something like this. Okay, we look at a wave form as representing the sound wave. And we'll look closer here for a second about how those waves look 
in relation to pitch. So we know frequency or pitch is just how high or how low the sound is. It doesn't have anything to do with the volume of the sound. And because we are scientific beings, as human beings, we like to be able to think about be able to think about quickly. Uh, it makes sense that we found a way to quantify or put a number to the frequency or pitch of sound. So we have an old dead white guy by the name of Heinrich Hertz. Okay? I don't know if any of you had the history of audio recording, but Hertz is mentioned in there, radio technology. He came up with this method of basically counting the number of complete waves or cycles per second for any given sound. And his theory basically was this, if we could graph one second of time and we had one complete wave cycle, like one complete ring in the pool of water, that would be a one hertz sound or one vibration per second. That would be an extremely low sound. You wouldn't even be able to hear it. Right? If in that same one second period we actually had 10 cycles, okay, that would be a 10 hertz sound you still wouldn't be able to hear it. A really good car subwoofer might be able to reproduce it, but you still wouldn't really be able to hear it. You'd be able to see the speaker going like this, but you just wouldn't be able to actually hear anything because it's below your threshold. Typically, we talk about sound as being expressed in hertz range that goes from, in human hearing range instance, it's 20 hertz to 20,000. And that's a really big range. So the 20 hertz is on the lower end, 20 cycles per second. That would be your lowest frequency bass notes. And then all the way up to 20,000 hertz or 20, or 20 kilohertz for your high frequency sense. This is only when you're young you're able to hear this range. Like my youngest daughter, who's three, would be able to hear pretty close to that 20 to 20,000 hertz range. Even by the time you're your age, it's already started to decrease, particularly on the more high frequency end. Okay, your years of iPod use and stuff like that has a, a toll on your body and on your system. Or if you're using loud guitar amps, it's probably even worse. Right? Um, it's interesting for a minute to compare how our frequency range of hearing compares to other creatures. Like dogs, for instance, are able to hear much higher frequencies than we are. I don't know if you've ever been to an off-leash dog park. Sometimes you'll see an owner in the park and it looks like he's talking into his hand or something or blowing into a whistle. You can't hear the whistle, but dogs everywhere are freaking out because okay, they can hear those high-frequency sounds that we can't, and that's what makes the dog whistle work. How about the mosquito ringtone? Has anybody downloaded that? Yeah. Okay. So the premise of the mosquito ringtone is that it emits a frequency higher than 20,000 or close to 20,000 hertz that you as teenagers can hear, but the idea is that adults like me are not going to be able to hear that high frequency sound. So you might get a ringtone that you can hear, but we can't. It doesn't always work. Okay? I have pretty good upper hearing range still, so generally I can find that stuff. Uh, contrast it with a mouse has really poor low frequency sound, but good in the higher range. Okay? And that makes sense for a, a mouse. You know, when you hear them, I don't know if any of you have ever caught a mouse or had one trapped somewhere, they squeak quite loudly. Right? That's how they're communicating. Cats are good over the entire range. That's what makes them great hunters. So they're able to hear low frequency vibrations like footsteps. That's how a cat seems to know you're in the room before you're even there. Right? They can hear you coming. Plus, they can hear those high-frequency sounds, even the ones that the mice are making, which makes them good hunters. Okay. So that was the first characteristic, the frequency or pitch. The one that we're concerned about next here is just the volume of the sound. So how loud is the sound? Right. We don't care about how many cycles there are. Oh, sorry. Are volume and level like the terms yep. Yep, volume and level basically mean the same thing. So if we talk about a high-level sound, we're talking about one that's loud. We don't care about how many cycles there are per second, how many waves there are per second for the volume. All we care about is the amplitude of the wave, how, how tall or how big is the wave actually set up. So when we graph or when we look at uh, uh, the waveform, as it gets larger on the right here, we're looking at a higher level sound. 
we have a scale for measuring that too. Decibels, okay, shortened as dB for decibels. And the decibel scale is a little bit tricky to understand. I don't even have it quite sorted out well. It's a logarithmic scale, so it's not following in a linear fashion. But suffice to say that higher decibel numbers are louder than lower decibel numbers. That's pretty easy to understand. Just to give you a sense of comparison, if we're having kind of a normal conversation in this room, that's probably about 60 decibels. Okay? If uh, you're running your hair dryer next to your ear in the morning, that's closer to uh, 90 decibels, okay? maybe a little louder. Uh, a full-on rock concert or a chainsaw, 105, 110 decibels, that's getting really loud. Right? Much higher than that, and you start to get into the area of possible hearing damage or loss even altogether. Look at that next number after chainsaw iPod at peak volume levels, 115 dB. Okay? That's loud. That is loud enough that extended listening at that kind of volume level will damage your hearing. This was the case too for Apple when they came out with the iPod in 1998 or 1999. Shortly after that, a couple of years after that, they started to get sued um, by parents who claimed that their child listened to their Apple iPod and now has experienced hearing loss as a result of using their iPod. And Apple basically said, well, this isn't our fault. Like, you know, it has a volume control on it, so you've got to teach your kids how to turn the volume down. The parents said, no, that's not good enough. You have to find a way to help us. So Apple's solution was a pretty, pretty simple one. They put a volume limiter inside every iPod. So as a parent, I do this with my, my older daughter's iPod. I go in there to her iPod, and I can set her volume level to be, say, three quarters as the maximum volume she can set. And she's free to turn it up or down, but she can't go past a certain point. And then I can lock it with a password. Okay. Same, uh, you know, or rather Apple did that um, so that they could um, basically get rid of these legal claims uh, that the product was causing these problems. Sounds above 115 dB are going to be painfully loud, like where you want to cover your ears over and do anything you can to get rid of the volume of the sound. It's just too loud. Some of you may have had the experience of being at a concert or listening to loud music and then you have that ringing in your ears afterward. If you haven't, I'm sure you'll be at a club at some point and you'll get it. Um, I've had that where for almost like two days afterward I could hear a bit of a ringing in the back of my, uh, just as a constant background sound. That's called tinnitus, and it's like a temporary form of hearing loss. Typically it goes away. Mine did, thankfully. But if that goes on too long, then you can just start to get permanent hearing loss, where either you can't hear low sounds or you can't hear high frequency sounds. We're just about done here, but there's a couple of other final things. We're going to be more concerned with sound recording to be able to record your commercials. And you're going to go through these sort of three main phases for sound recording. Here's a picture of kind of a typ typical studio setup so with a musician working away, microphones in place for receiving sound, big mixing console in the corner there. We'll t talk about what that is in a minute. They're also working in uh, a room here that's got wood on the walls and then we see some kind of acoustical padding along the walls in the back there. That's in an effort in the wood. In the case of the wood, it's reflecting sound. Okay, it bounces off there. In the case of the foam areas here, it's absorbing sound to deaden it. All of the rooms that we work in here, including the sound room, have that spaghetti material on the walls. That helps deaden sound so that it doesn't echo unnecessarily. But we've got these three main stages we're going to go through. Input, process and output. So the input stage is where you're collecting sound. So any equipment that creates sound that can be recorded is an input device. A microphone, CD player, uh, an instrument like a keyboard or a guitar. Even your iPod or a computer could be considered an input device because you could hook an iPod up to a recording system and record from the headphone jack of the iPod. So lots of different input devices. You'll be using the microphone, obviously, uh, and maybe an instrument if you really wanted to. 
second stage is sound processing. So what happens after we have the sound come in from those input devices? All kinds of different processing devices, some of them just make sounds louder, like amplifiers. Okay? Amplifier will take the low volume signal from a small microphone or the low volume signal from your iPod, for instance, and it will amplify it and make it louder. So that's a processing device. These get pretty complicated, right? If you're looking at home theater setups, they have, you know, seven or up to now 9.1 channels surround sound, right? This device in the middle here is a mixing console. There's one in each of the audio rooms that we have here, although you're not really going to be using it. We use more of a virtual version inside the computer. But the mixing console, particularly for live sound, like at a concert, is really important because this is the processing device that lets you mix and blend all the different sounds together. So mixing consoles typically will have these big sliding buttons at the bottom called faders. And each one of those faders will control the volume of an input device. So on this mixing console here, I'm going to guess it has about 18 faders or something. So we'd call it an 18 channel mixer. And we could have 18 different microphones and instruments all hooked up to that. And then we can blend all those sounds together to create the mix. If you're at a concert again at some point, look for the sound guy. You'll always find the sound person about midway uh, through the audience, right dead center in the middle of the room, because that's the best listening spot. Okay, If you go to a movie theater or you get tickets for a concert, you want to get the sweet spot, they call it. That's middle of the room uh, and about midway from the back to the front of the room. That's the best sounding spot. So the audio guy will always be there fiddling with all those knobs. The other processing device we're going to use is um, the computer. We're going to use GarageBand to do our recording and our uh, mixing and blending of the sounds. Advantages to that, right, in the computer is that you have complete control. Sound comes in, sound gets processed, mixed together, amplified. Then we've got to output it. We have to do something with it generally. So. Any equipment that plays back sound or stores sound could be considered an output device, like a set of loudspeakers. Okay. They will take that signal from the amplifier and convert the electrical signal in the amplifier back into something mechanical that you can hear, right? Because we know sound is kinetic. Something has to move, you know. Wires don't move. Sound travels along the wire, but the wire itself, you can't put your ear up to the wire. Even if you put it really close to your ear, you're not going to hear anything got to have it hooked up to a loudspeaker. And so now we've got the diaphragm of the speaker that moves back and forth. That creates the sound again. Good loudspeakers have two different, at least two different drivers. Big ones called woofers for low frequency sound. And then smaller ones called tweeters that reproduce the higher frequency sounds. Hard with one speaker to reproduce the entire range. Headphones are nothing more than miniature speakers put inside plastic cans you can put in your ears. Okay. Even the earbuds for your iPod have a miniature speaker built inside there. And I mean like about the size of a pencil eraser tip inside one of those little earbuds that does actually move back and forth. Those are all for listening to sound. Devices that record sound can be considered an output device too. So uh, a blank. CD or DVD, some kind of medium, or hard drive you can record onto. So we often consider an iPod or a computer an output device too, because so we can send record sound back to it. Okay. So we've got the input process output stage. For your quiz that comes up in about a week's time or so, go back through these slides when you're studying and just be familiar with um, the ways that we measure the volume of sound in decibels the way that we measure frequency and pitch and hertz. Okay. Uh, you can be just about guaranteed there'll be one or two quiz questions uh, around those topics.